Good morning and thank you for joining us for Winship Grand Rounds. If you are an Emory University or healthcare employee and would like to receive a CME credit for attending today, the login information can be found in the chat feature on the bottom of your screen. If you have any issues with this webinar or the CME login, please send Julie Hawkins an email or just drop a note via the chat feature. This morning, we are very pleased to welcome a special guest, Dr. Narjust Duma. Dr. Duma is originally from Venezuela, born of a Colombian mother and a Dominican father. She completed her internal medicine residency in Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School and fellowship at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, where she served as a chief fellow. She is now the Associate Director of Cancer Equity Program and a thoracic medical oncologist at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Harvard Cancer Center. Dr. Duma's clinical interests include targeted therapy for lung cancer and the care of women with lung cancer, including their unique aspects of cancer survivorship. She is the principal investigator of the Sexual Health Assessment in Women with Lung Cancer Study, the largest study to date evaluating sexual dysfunction in women with lung cancer. Apart from her clinical interest in lung cancer, she was also a leading and productive researcher in cancer health disparities, gender and racial discrimination in medical education and medicine. Dr. Duma is one of the co-founders of their Twitter community, hashtag Latinas in Medicine, now composed of over 6,500 members globally. She has received many awards, including the 2018 Resident of the Year Award by the National Hispanic Medical Association, the Mayo Brothers Distinguished Fellowship Award, and the 2020 Rising Star Award by the LEAD National Conference for Women in Hematology and Oncology. In, ad in addition, Dr. Duma founded the Duma Lab in 2019. The laboratory focuses on lung cancer, social justice issues in medicine, and medical education. The laboratory long-term goals are to create a welcoming environment for medical trainees from historically underrepresented groups in medicine while improving the care of vulnerable populations. Members of the Duma Lab are agents of change. Since its foundation, the Duma Lab has received research funding from several national agencies, published over 15 studies and editorials, and presented research findings at national and international conferences, including the American Society of Clinical Oncology annual meeting and the World Conference on Lung Cancer. We are very, very excited to have Dr. Duma joining us today for Grand Rounds. Uh, she's a, a friend of, of many of us who specialize in thoracic oncology, and we couldn't be happier to have you give us a lecture this morning. So welcome, Dr. Duma. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Higgins. It is um, always good to get to learn from you and to meet you. I'm going to proceed to share my screen. Um, Julie, let me know if everything looks good. Um, as soon as I click here. Oops. Okay. Sorry, everyone. It looks good, though. Yeah, I just want to make sure that people don't see everything in previous. Yes. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very del I'm delighted to be here. And we're going to talk about gender equity, but I want to talk to you beyond salary. Why beyond salary? The salary discrepancies between women and men uh, in medicine exists, and they continue to exist. Um, it's estimated as around a difference of $100,000 um, in salaries um, in general for all the specialties when we cross match for training, for publications, and for other ways of measuring academic success or clinical success. These are my disclosures. Um, so, why is it important? First, before we start talking, gender equity and balance in medicine is the ethical thing to do. We are, as women in medicine, represented over 51% of medical students and release, and this started in 2017. The problem is that we have an issue in the lack of representation and leadership. So we are over 51% of medical school applicants and students, and that number continues to rise. 48% of medical school grads. Then we're around 48 to 50% of residents. But as you can see in this figure, we continue to lose um, representation as we lead to leadership. With department shared, so around 18%, and deans around 80% to self-identify as women. So a lot of these things, a lot of these issues are based on something called gender bias. So when we grew up, as we grew up, we are, the, we are told that girls do this and boys do that. And that fills into our unconscious bias. Unconscious bias are intrinsic mechanisms for which we uh, create stereotypes 
in order to set up information quickly. One of the challenges about unconscious bias, or which gender bias is a type, is that in moments of stress, we usually uh, let the unconscious bias take over. So this happens in hospital settings like ours, in which we're in constant stress. And in, since February of 2020, we have been in high levels of stress. So gender bias that we think that one gender may be better than another, and it's largely based in stereotypes. We, in unconscious bias, besides gender bias, we have affinity bias, and this affects women because we feel more comfortable around people that look, sound like us, or have similar experiences. Another to have, in, in, instead of having that room full of diversity that you see here, for many people it's easier to get people that look and sounds like you and have your similar experiences. So when we're putting together a search committee, those unconscious bias allow us to call our friends or people that we know and then creates a homogeneous group. And then we don't include the historical underrepresented groups of medicine. So affinity bias and gender bias are the ones that we have to fight in order to achieve gender equity. So I'm talking to highly educated people and I think a lot of us are like me, I'm biased, really? It is me that I'm biased? Well, we are all biased. I have um, done this survey, the Project Implicit Bias from Harvard Medical School to determine my own unconscious bias and I share that I have unconscious bias against um, stay-at-home moms. I'm, I'm the daughter of a surgeon, the grandmother of a pediatrician. So for me, the norm is that women go to medical school. So I will invite all of you to go and take the, uh, one survey or two for the Project Implicit Bias to get to know a little bit and also to be very humble. I think often we think that because we're healthcare providers that we're highly educated, we are no bias, but we all do have some type of bias against a group or another. And this is a consequence or education or exposures in the media. So we have grown with the blue and the pink. And today on purpose, I'm wearing both colors. Um, so boys go with your dad, they play with trucks, they are okay to be a uh, ladies man, and then Women, uh, the girls are with the mom, they wear pink, they need to learn how to cook, how to behave, and they need to be very careful what to say, how they behave. These are the gender stereotypes that we have grown up to. Like, I, I have a brother and I remember how even my mom, who was a single mother surgeon, we have different expectations for both of us. So gender is a fluid concept, and this picture is way too old. Um, and we need to move from the concept that women do this, men do this, because they're both capable of doing all of this. And gender bias is not only against women, but also exists against men. But unfortunately in medicine, the pay gap, the inequalities, made the environment very hostile for women. We use different words to describe male and female leaders. We tend to use words that are more assertive or very analytical for men. Like he's a leader, he uh, is task oriented, he's very competent. And for women, we use things that are more compassionate or relationship based. Uh, she contributes to positive work uh, environment. But these words, unfortunately, have less value. So when you're writing a letter of recommendation, when you're writing um, an evaluation, gender bias trickles in and affects how you write that evaluation. I have seen you know, evaluations in which, and there has been several studies evaluating this in which, you know, the women are described as she is very good with patients, patients have great report, but then men are described, he is a natural leader and I only see great things for them. Even if they have the same step scores, the same evaluations by patients. So these gender stereotypes is what affects how we talk about each other. And we have to mention our non-binary colleagues because for them, um, all of these tends to be very challenging because they tend to be forced in one of these two categories. Are you a male or you're a female? Um, when in both, when they're non-binary and they don't identify firmly to one group or another. So you may have heard about this study. Uh, in this study, in which two exact same curriculums for um, research assistant, 
program managers were shared for over 80 to 100 people. The only difference between one CV and the other was the name, a female versus a male name. What the investigators found is that gender bias was so intricate that even being the CV exactly the same thing, only the first name was the difference. Women were less likely to be hired. Women will also offer a lower salary than men. And what is impressive about this study, which is at the University of Wisconsin, where I used to be, so shout out to my old boss, Dr. Liao, is that this study was in 1999. And we're still talking about it because it hasn't changed. So the only difference was the first name and still women were less likely to be hired. And I love this cartoon because it's like, are you a lumberjack? And she's like, no, what about a lumber Jill? And the challenge with this is that we get measured the same way, but then we are no value the same. So how is this? We need the same step scores to pass a step one, a step two, step three. We need to send training for residency and fellowship compared to all male counterparts, but then we're less likely to be higher, even if everything has been cross-matched. And that is a big problem because my gender shouldn't determine why I'm being higher or not. It should be my qualifications and training. But this study is a good reminder that gender bias is still alive and well. So let's all break stereotypes. I often talk to my mentees like, let's all break stereotypes. I'm a Latina, um, a very proud Latina, and there are a lot of stereotypes, like I'm supposed to be spicy and other adjectives like that. And there are many, many campaigns to break in gender stereotypes, which we need to continue to do. The problem is that it comes with a price. Gender stereotypes are there for the people or the women that break the gender stereotypes, they have to pay a tax for it. So it's like you cannot win, right? If you stay with in the gender stereotypes that you have been assigned, it will be very unlikely that you will reach a leadership position because you are going to be described as compassionate, improving the work environment. But then if you become, uh, you try to cross that gender stereotype, then you play pay the price of being judged by your uh, colleagues. You may be described as an alpha woman, like I've been described as one. You, you may be described with words like aggressive or other less no so nice adjectives. And you're also less likely to be liked by your staff, even if you have the same behavior that your male counterparts. So I'm talking this to you so you understand that for many women that work with you, it is a very challenging situation in which you want to advance in leadership. And if you develop those leadership skills, you're still going to be disliked. But if you don't, you're not going to be promoted. So it is a fight against gender stereotypes that you want to break, but you also don't want to pay a high price. 63 different studies show that women who assert their ideas make direct requests and advocate for themselves are like less compared to men. 63 different studies in different settings, sociology, medicine, government, engineering. And with these women are often classified as trouble women, but they have the same behavior than the male counterparts. But it's 2021. When are we gonna stop punishing women for violating outdated gender stereotypes? When I'm I'm going to stop being called problematic or um, she is very aggressive just because I'm not following the gender stereotype when my grandma was in medical school. So I want to ask the audience on the chat box um, to let me know why do you think what we have talked so far that women in oncology are less likely to. An example. Women in oncology are less likely to be hired as a chair of a department. I want to make this as interactive as possible, so please feel free to put the stuff in the chat. Just auctions off, uh, and you can send it directly to me if you want. Um, what in oncology? This is our neighborhood, right? We're talking about the problem in medicine, but for oncology, this is our people, our friends. 
Where, what happens to women in oncology? Are they less likely to be hired? Are they less likely to be promoted? Just put what you know and what you think um, is affecting us every day in our neighborhood. So you can send it directly to me. Women in oncology are less likely to be department chairs. That's correct. Perceived as not tough enough, an emotional job. Less likely to be NIH funded. That is 100% correct and that has been studied. Society are worse. Yes, less likely to be an editorial worse. Yes, and they're seen as team players. And this is true. We are team players, but we are not the leader. And for many of you, it's often when we round that, you know, we're confused as another member of the team instead of the attendant. So hiring women in oncology are less likely to be hired compared to men, less likely to be promoted, grant funded, leadership, advisory boards, pharma advisory boards, are women are less likely to be invited, clinical trials, to be a leader in a clinical trial or to receive awards. And this is our neighborhood. This is the people that sit next to you. This is the people that you share that workplace with. So we're gonna share a little bit of the research that we have done at the Duma Lab. So the Matilda effect, the Matilda effect is when a woman uh, achievement, scientific achievement is incorrectly assigned to a male colleague. There has been way too many stories like this, but these are some of the most famous one. Rosalind Park, Rosalind Frank, Rosalind Frankel, Marie Curie, in which their work was assigned to some other colleagues. And in some cases, you may have worked as hard as you could and get a Nobel Prize. But this is the highlight of the economic times. Indian American MIT professor, Professor Banerjee, and wife wins Nobel Prize in economics. So this is how the women, they are less likely to receive the credit and the credit may be assigned to a male colleague uh, or a husband. So we evaluated the under recognitions of women in hematology and oncology awards. We evaluated all awards for 26 years for the top seven societies of hematology and oncology. Gender-specific awards, which have come in the last few years, were excluded. And we discovered that this is in response to the active membership. Women are not receiving, they are significantly not receiving um, awards or societies. Something that really strikes me is like this green light here is the membership for ESMO. But of all ESMO awards in the last 26 years, only 9% have gone to women. Let's talk about something in our neighborhood, ASCO. Around 28% have been women, which is closer to the member, member gender breakdown. But in some areas, like radiation oncology, we're still in the 11%, and if we get to surgery, this is a significant lack of representations and awards. We saw an increase though over time. So we are, women are most likely to receive awards, but if you can see here, none of these crosses the 40%. And when we look into something more, not only gender, but racial distribution, we observe that there was a significant also lack of representation of people like me, or people like many of the members of the Duma Lab. ASCO have five, Black or African Americans that have received an award. ESMO had zero. The Society of Surgical Oncology had one. And for Hispanics, the numbers were very similar. So we are going to introduce to you a concept, which is the concept of intersectionality. And the concept of intersectionality is that we don't face only one challenge, and human experiences are no straight lines. Human experiences and interactions with our colleagues are the consequence of several factors that intersect. And for some people, many factors intersect at the same time. There is no such a thing as a single issue struggle. And I think when we look at gender equity, we need to stop thinking that this is a woman's problem and then 
you put a comma and this is a minority problem, you put a comma, this is a LGBTQ problem. No, it is a result that intersectionality, some subjects have many factors that have bias against them. And why is this important? Because despite being women, we don't share the same experience. And my heart and condolences goes to the family of the young girl that was missing and then found dead. But that is not the same experience for many Native American women. Many Native American women are missing, they have been killed, and they are not in the media for days nonstop, like we saw it with the other case. So this is the aspect of gender equity that we need to continue to talk, is that women's experience are not the same we in the same group. In the state of Wyoming, there's 710 indigenous people, mostly girls, younger women, that have been missing over the past decade. So we do not share the same experiences. And that's what interse intersectionality is. I'm gonna give you an example. And this is an example just based on me, on myself. So I didn't have to use anybody else. So you pay the gender tax. Oh, you're so aggressive. Oh, um, yeah, you should be less aggressive. Then you pay the minority tax. You would like to be part of the seventh equity inclusion committee or, oh, you're a Latina, you're so spicy. And then you pay the age tax. Oh, you're so young, you don't know that. Like back in the day, yeah, you don't know you're so young, NJ. So you pay so many taxes that at the end, this is how you end. Exhausted and you get home and you have no money left or no effort left because you're paying the gender tax, the minority tax, and the age tax. And there's some groups that pays way more taxes, LGBTQ, non-binaries. Um, so we need to understand that the gender challenges are higher and, and even more worrisome for certain groups than others. And I have to say, this is no um, advertisement for Dunkin' Donuts. I know I'm living in Boston now, but that's what I happened to have that day. So what's happening with all of this? Well, one of the challenges with this is that women are not getting paid the same, but when you divide them by race, then the, the challenges are even worse. So this is data from the American Association of Medical Colleges that identify that Hispanic women were the group that is less likely to be paid. So we are comparing 0.69 cents to a dollar compared to the white men. So this is the aspirin intersectionality in which you pay so many taxes and you get affected by so many things that gender bias is an issue that piles into more other issues. And what happens when there is an environment that is hostile? that you look around left and right and nobody looks like you. Well, there's exodus and we're seeing that now. I often am in meetings in which we are like, we need to improve the diversity of here and there, which is important. But recruiting a diverse faculty, recruiting uh, any medical student or resident for a historical underrepresented group in medicine is not the end of the journey, it's just the beginning. So recruiting somebody from different background without providing inclusion policies, is like you get invited to the prom, but you don't get asked to dance. So many people are leaving. So this is a graph for this year in which a lot of, academic, a lot of assistant professors are leaving, around 34%, um, around 40% for African-American men, in which they're leaving before they're promoted, or oh, they have challenges being promoted, and they're leaving academic medicine. So you can create power. You have the power to create equity. And I'm going to share with you some of the things that we have been doing in order to do that. So I'm often the only Latina at the table. And like my friend here, uh, <laughs> like 2019, right, when we have in-person conferences. The isolation is very common. For women in places in which they are not the majority group, or in general. So we found that the Latinas in medicine community to generate that sense of belonging, to connect Latinas to go to kindergarten. So 
let Latinx kids can see that, yeah, you can be a doctor and to develop long lasting relationships. And all of these started with a tweet and now it's a hashtag and a group of brave women all around the country. In addition, we moved forward and text to the help of Dr. Gladys Rodriguez. We were able to collect funds. Many of you here today donated uh, to this effort and I thank you. We were able to fund the first Young Investigator Award for Latinas in Medicine through the Conquer Cancer Foundation. Dr. Per per Edith Perez was one of our speakers. Um, and now we're gonna go on effort number two to try to fund another Latina because funding can be very challenging um, for minority groups. And we know that it has been proven over and over again, but you have the power to create equity. The Duma Lab started as a dream at the University of Wisconsin as a group of researchers that were driven by social justice and how has become what some of you know as the Duma Lab. The main goal of the Duma Lab is to change how mentorship is done for many women of color. And this editorial for the cancer uh, letter was published by my mentees and members of the Duma Lab um, without my knowledge and when I was very sick. But you, you as a person, you have a lot of power. We don't have to wait for the system to change. You can create equity today. In addition, we have partnered with Medscape and the Duma Lab to talk about things that need to be discussed. So Dr. Malapati, one of the Duma Lab members, has a blog about the parental leave in which you are penalized if you don't have kids and you're penalized when you come back. Why are physicians of color leaving academia? So I invite all of you to read some of our posts and um, this picture here is during my time at University of Wisconsin with the Latinas at uh, or institution. In addition to all medical students that may be here, or if you have a medical student, we have developed an intersectionality curriculum with the American Medical Women's Association that is free to medical trainees and mentors. So if you want to learn more about intersectionality, how is not only one issue, then um, you can reach out to the American Medical Women's Association. The curriculum is available. And it's all online now. So what happens, we are gonna to continue to tell the story about women in medicine. And I want you to hear from somebody else besides me. So we often encounter daily reminders. Daily reminders that the environment in which we are was initially created not to welcome us. And it is important to say that it's no men versus women, or other group versus women. We women also have gender bias in which there could be judgment for having kids, for not having kids, for bringing your kid to work. So this is no, we are one against the other. We all can improve, we all can get better, so we can create an environment for that 52% of medical students that are being trained right now. And as I mentioned, there is gender is a fluid cancer concept and they're non-binary genders and we also have transsexual individuals so they also face a lot of gender bias and a lot of discrimination when we're talking about women in medicine today it is important that we also acknowledge that they struggle significantly as they're often trying to be put in a box or a label so the gender equity work that we have done started very early um, and I told this story about my ASCO study. He all started with a tweet. So in ASCO 2018, I noticed that the person that was full time, a full professor in a panel was the only person that was introduced by first name. And the only difference between that person and the other was gender. So I put out a, to a poll trying to find out if it, this was a real issue. I got 32 responses, but importantly, these give the motivation to conduct a study to evaluate speaker introductions at ASCO. Again, we're in our neighborhood. So we evaluated over 2,500 introductions, and we found the female speakers were less likely than male speakers to receive a formal, formal address. 
What this refers is to being introduced as doctor last name or doctor full name. In addition, female speakers were more likely to be introduced by first name. And why is this important? People are like, oh, we are friends. Well, logistics ha studies have shown that if you are introduced as NJ is here to talk about lung cancer in women, people are less likely to believe my data and people are less likely to pay attention. And now with smartphones, that is quite important. And when you're in the ASCO podium, this is a career milestone. So we published this study, but something that we learned from this is that some of these research don't, doesn't have a lot of fans. So Dr. Powell posted a tweet only with the asterisk. It was a day before the presentation. And for the first time, I encountered the challenges of social media and how this data could affect people's personal space. I re we received emails, direct messages, interactions in which I was told I was a good researcher until now, that I was dividing the society. And it's important to mention I was still a fellow. And one of the things that really stuck with me is like, is it a good idea to encourage documentation of gender inequality? Was a question in an email. So I always wonder if it would have received this online harassment if I wasn't part of a minority group or if I wasn't a woman, but it's unclear. But some of this research comes with a prize. But everything has a positive side, so the language of respect was developed and which were providing the chairs some guidance on how to introduce uh, speakers before there was no guidance. This language of respect has been adapted by societies all across the country and it has been translated to five different languages. So the result of this study provided change. So we also encounter microaggressions. Microaggressions are short comments that have the goal of marginalizing a group. Many of them are unconscious and they're based on that gender bias we talk about. They're based on that affinity bias. But I want you to hear from two amazing women um, about their experience with microaggressions. Hello, my name is Kelly Mercier. I'm an adjunct associate professor at Duke University. While microaggressions can either be verbal or nonverbal, the kind that I experience the most are nonverbal. I'm often left off of meetings at certain hours of the day because there are assumptions based on the fact that I'm a woman and a mother that I must be tending to my family at certain times. What do microaggressions mean to me? Microaggressions are, are me walking into a patient's room and being fully interrogated about my personal life and my education history before we can even proceed with the office visit. Or microaggressions can be me constantly having to validate that yes, indeed, I am a physician and I am the fellow leading the team with the consultant and not my male white intern. And these examples just touch the tip of the iceberg. And yet as benign as it sounds, carrying the burden of these daily insidious microaggressions really becomes an onerous mental and emotional burden that significantly adds to my daily stressors. So you can be an upstander and I wanna invite all of you to do that. Upstanders, when you see these microaggressions happen, you can serve as a person to stop the microaggression if the person has no stop it then Else, because you can create equity. The goal of my talk to you today is to motivate you to understand that you have a lot of power as an individual to create gender equity. So there are further gender disparities in oncology that our lab has studied, um, and we're going to quickly go over some of this. Uh, one of them is about journals, editorial boards. Who is the who are the person reviewing our articles? We know. If we have a diverse editorial board, uh, we learn from other people and we have higher ideas. But we find out that 73% of editorial boards and the top 10 um, journals of hematology, oncology, radiation oncology, and surgical oncology are men, 73%. And when you look deeper into the numbers, 
there's only a few editors in chief that are women. And also there is a lack of representation of minorities. We 71% of the editorial members um, as non-Hispanic white. So an editorial board, lack of diversity leads to a loss of different perspectives and medicine, which overall delays innovation. This data was presented at ASCO 2021. And it's important to mention what has happened and what is happening with COVID-19. COVID-19 has increased the burden on women. Um, social standards are that women should care for kids, but now the kids are at home and these women in medicine still have a full-time job. So we have seen this in data that was published by ESMO, which is the group on women for oncology. We saw a study from India, from Latin America, in which COVID-19 has increased the burden to women and medicine. In addition, is delaying the progress that was made before when the social standards continue and the responsibility increases, the women are the ones that are more likely to stay at home, the ones that are most likely to set back uh, some of the research or career opportunities. So we conducted a study called the ola Kobe study. This is a study to evaluate the impact of work-related fatigue and satisfaction among oncology providers in Latin America. Over a period of four weeks, we were able to interview over 700 healthcare providers from Mexico to Argentina. And we observed gender differences. And it's important to mention that gender stereotypes are quite strong in Latin America. So 86% of women that fill out the survey, these are physicians, feel exhausted by their work, compared to 68% of men. 72% reported work-related fatigue versus 56%. And 61 of them, their fatigue has increased compared to times of COVID. So this study shows that the burden in female physicians increased um, during the COVID times, particularly for this cohort of Latin America. We also have seen that gender bias affects your fellows. Those trainees that you have in clinic are now very conscious about how gender bias plays a role. So this is a study that was also presented from our lab at ASCO, in which fellows were interviewed. So compared to male, females are mistaken as a known physician 94% of the time have been, like 94% of them reported they have been mistaken as a known physician versus 22%. Uh, they have experienced bias 67% versus 11%. Something that we review in their comments is many of these fellows, these female fellows, their second guess over and over again when they make a clinical decision, which doesn't happen to their male colleagues as much. And why are these women doing? A lot of these women are they wear their white coat because they're less likely to be confused. They're wearing their doctor reading badge, these doctors, and they're closing. So this is a burden. I have to wake up, look extra professional so I can be identified by the role I already have. So as we come to the end of the presentation, I wanted you to know that I'm not here to make you comfortable, not to highlight all the work that you have done, but I'm here to help you become an active ally. Are you a woman? Are you a man? Are you non-binary or any other groups? Because the fight against gender inequalities is a fight that needs to be with everybody included because it's the ethical thing to do. If I train, to the exams and the everything. Why do I have to be undermined? Why I cannot be promoted? Just because I was born as a woman. So now we're gonna talk how I can make you, or I can help you uh, become an active ally. I have to say that being an ally is extremely important, but being an active ally is the thing that we all have to do. Active means you take action and that you're ally for all groups. I want to share uh, some, some colleagues that have helped me. ...at national meetings, we're delegating equally to males and females. I really believe that by looking within, by ensuring these dynamics are appropriate within our own research groups, we can slowly enact a change at a national and international level. We're all better off in a gender equal society. To that end, it's important for male colleagues 
to be active allies to female colonies. And there are different ways to do that. You have to lead by example. You have to be vocal and point out, highlight gender bias, lack of representation on panels, committees, in leadership positions, not necessarily to confront, but to raise awareness, to educate. Implicit bias is not conscious. So by highlighting, by calling attention to these biases, you can implement change now and shape future behavior. Another important thing is to share capital. Whether it's social influence or academic opportunities, you have to go out of your way to nominate, to elevate female colleagues. This is not a zero sum game. We all benefit from gender equity. We need allies now more than ever against gender bias and discrimination in medicine. And there are many things we can do as a community to be active allies. We should offer to help and offer to be available and offer opportunities and our own connection. And we should respect each other ideologies. And yes, we may have different views, different ideologies, but we should see these differences as sacred gifts. So, how can you become an active ally? Well, these are, I'm gonna give you a few tips that you can start using today. Bring others to the table. We're often in a meeting, a Zoom meeting now, or an in-person meeting in which certain people manipulate or are the leaders of the conversation. But you can bring that person that is often not at the table or is at the table, but is not given the opportunity to be part of the conversation. Like, Shanoa, what can we do next? Narjus, what do you think about this? This is a little thing that you can do to create equity. Another thing, call out manos. So where are manos? Manos are conference um, advisory boards in which they're 100% male dominated. There's no female representation. We have leaders in every sub-specialty of oncology that are women and men. So if you get invited to a meeting, and then there is six people giving a talk and they're all men. You can quickly email those persons, even mention, I noticed there is the lack of uh, diversity in our panel. Um, I would feel more comfortable or I would recommend the following woman to be included. So you can advocate for more women and members on the represented groups as keynote speakers and panelists. If we, there is a panelist that cancel, you can bring somebody. A quick email, a quick suggestion makes a difference. And there are women in every group of oncology that are great speakers and that, you know, be able to um, join the panel and we stop being a mano. And you can stop microaggressions like we mentioned. If you are rounding and there is a microaggression directed to your female fellow, to your female resident, comments like, what do you mean by that? Can make the aggressor stop and understand that the comment wasn't appropriate. Or simple say, um, I don't think that comment was appropriate. You have the power. That doesn't require to write a grant, to be part of a committee. You can do all of this. Be aware of pronouns. And they're no preferred pronouns. They're pronouns is what people self-identify with. So be aware of them. Many people are incorporating them into their Zoom meetings, into their email. So pay attention to them. It is extremely important. How will you feel if I call you with the wrong pronoun? Try to take that as a moment of self-reflection. Also, you can be an ally. Women are highly likely to be interrupted in meetings. The higher the meeting, the more likely to be interrupted. What I mean by it, the higher the leadership the meeting, if it's a CEO meeting, a executive committee meeting, and you can be an ally as a woman, a man on blonde binary saying, I'm sorry, but you just interrupted Dr. Perez. And you can also no apologize. And you can say, you interrupted Dr. Perez. You also need to demand accountability for institutions. And this is salaries. You need to have salary accountability. And this is not only the general salary, also includes bonuses signing bonus, retention bonus, and which there are significant disparities. We created this uh, for ASCO 2020, in which how you can promote gender equity um, in social media. And you can take a picture of this, and I'm happy to send you a PDF in which this top six things to do. 
promote the worker researches equally regardless of gender. I avoid language that perpetuate gender stereotypes. Use gender neutral language when it's appropriate. You can call out people that are inappropriate towards women and other groups. And like I told my mentees, delete, report, delete, and move on. So finally, as we come to the end, I want you to know that your voice can reach those that are struggling. I have been surprised that when I advocate for one of my mentees, there was people around it that also hear that. When you are an upstander against a microaggression, that medical student that's in the back feels empowered to stop a microaggression in the future. When you ask somebody about gender challenges and how you can help, somebody in the back may be hearing and feel empowered. If you remain quiet or silent, you are also part of the problem and it's a form of validation. If your personality is not the one to like stop a microaggression in the flesh, you can do it by email. You can do it by phone call. You can do it by WhatsApp. But remain quiet is a problem. And there is enough size. There is no sizes of the pie for everyone. This is not a fight about me getting this, you losing that. It's about us working together to improve the inequalities that we have been facing since uh, let's be honest, thousands of years. You have the power to create change, to empower that medical oncology fellow, to empower the resident, your colleagues, to ask for equality when it comes to gender and medicine. Most important, active allies sponsor. A sponsor and mentor share are different. A sponsor is when you give somebody an opportunity and you put your reputation at play. For example, I would recommend Dr. Awali for this talk instead of me because I cannot make it. Oh, Dr. So-and-so can do this. Um, so you're putting somebody, you're putting your reputation um, at risk or you're sponsoring somebody to an activity. Mentorship is when we guide someone, but we are not putting sono or work at risk. And both of them are necessary for gender equity. Women are often over mentor and under sponsor. And to advocate, if you have any type of leadership, oh, just being a doctor gives you a lot of leadership, you can advocate for gender equity. When you're hiring somebody, you can ask us like, are we providing this in salary? Is this person being accommodated for their needs? And the most important thing is active allies take action. You can talk about it, you can retweet it, but action is what matters. Invite people to talk. And buy women to be part of the conversation. And ask them how they're doing, which is also important. The burden of women during COVID-19 has doubled. I thank you all for your time. We're going to proceed to the Q&A session. Um, and I'm thankful to be here today. Thank you, Dr. Dama. That was a, a wonderful lecture. Um, as we wait for people to post questions in the chat, I just want to remind everybody that we will not have a Grand Rounds lecture next week. Um, and also, if you need to get your CME credit, there is a link in the chat that Julie has uh, posted multiple times, so you can refer to that. And also, Julie's available if you have any questions about how to claim that CME. Um, awesome. We have lots of questions coming in. Um, so let me just start with one for Dr. Duma. Um, let's see, I would like to ask if the society slide was all members or MD specific. I believe there are a lot of APPs who are women and could lead to a false appearance of gender parity in the total numbers. So for the number of the societies, this was obtained for the societies itself, and it was divided by ND, PhDs, and other healthcare providers. So the numbers we have is for NDs. But I agree with that. And I think it's important to mention that women are a very large percenter or APPs. Uh, workforce is underappreciated often, and they have their unique challenges that need to be studied further, including a high rate of burnout because they have very high clinical duties and compared to many NDs. Yeah, that's a great point. So here is a really a statement posed by Dr. Amy Chen that I think um, would be good to discuss. 
The Theranos blowback has been that women scientific entrepreneurs are second guessed and needing to surmount a higher threshold than in past situations where males have failed, but essentially haven't been subject to as much scrutiny. Can you talk about how that concept affects women in leadership within healthcare in terms of having to um, reach a higher standard or you know, being under more scrutiny than their male peers in leadership and, and what to do about that, what we can do about that issue? Yes, and let me start with a phrase that I think all of us have been asked. Can you smile some more? Can you smile more? Or just smile for me? So that's something that I never heard, um, you know, be encountered for some of my male colleagues. So yes, there are high standards. You need to look, you need to talk in a certain way. You also need to do your full-time job. And you also need to, you also will be judged for some of your domestic responsibilities. So it's this whole fight of filling all these boxes when you're still underestimated. So yes, there's different scrutiny and leadership. Um, women are most likely to be judged by what they wear compared to their male colleagues when they're in leadership. And we learned this from the last few years in the media, when there's more talk about pantsuit than a political agenda. So women are challenges in a different way and um, measure with so many different, different metrics, right? You need to be the head of the cancer center. You also need to be a good mom because you know that's part of the job. You cannot be too aggressive. And let me just don't invite you to give the talk because you're too aggressive. So there are highest standards and there are many boxes. So it's like, there is no win. You need to feel the old gender stereotypes and you need to feel, you also need to feel the leadership stereotypes. And it can be challenging and exhausting. And that's why so many women are leaving academia, right? And the pandemic showed that, that, and we know this Dr. Higgins, many of our friends are leaving. Mm-hmm. Because there's a hostile environment that we metrics that you may never meet. Yeah, absolutely. This is a, another great great question um, from Dr. Kuchikar. How do you bring these issues up to people that really need to hear about it? I.e., often male leaders um, may not be present to hear the discussion that we're having right now about these important issues. And what is the best way to approach these important issues that have sensitivity around them? Um, and in ways that can really enact change within the leadership. So there has been several approaches. One approach that, well, I guess is I have used is I sit out of the office and I wait um, sometimes just to discuss these issues. But I think bringing the results of a study, data has power. So we, you remember in 2019, we continue to say, yeah, I'm not being introduced by my professional title, but it has a comment, right? It was a it was an anecdote. But when we got the data, we presented it to the ASCO leadership. It's like, here is the data. So a lot of things that has been helpful for these interventions is that we have very well-designed studies that show the inequality, so you show up with data. Not only about your personal story of discrimination, but we interview a thousand, for the OCEAN study, we interview almost a thousand um, oncologists, female oncologists. So I show, we show up with the data. This is the data and the data has power. So every time I'm going to a leader, I come with data because that's the way to back up what we all experience. And our experience are important, but we have to say pie charts and graphs have a power. So come to leaders with data. Also email, like about the editorial boards, we email every editor in chief to let them know the issues that we found and that prompted conversations with this editor in chief that we're not conscious and we have seen some changes from these simple emails in which more women has been, for example, more women has been invited to become associate editors at JCO. So data helps with change. Email, I have we have email the leaders with the results of the data has been very, very helpful. Yeah, and I think you're right about the email. A, a personal approach, a call to action to an individual can be really powerful and, and it many times works, um, maybe more than you would think. Um, another great question about how to handle microaggressions. How do you handle a microaggression that you may witness and you go back and think about it and then you're in shock, oh my gosh, how did that happen? But sometimes it's difficult to actually say something you know, in real time when it is happening and how can you address that after the fact? 
it is like going to the gym. So the first, um, you know, you're often taking a shower or driving home and you're like, oh no, no, she did, she, he, or it didn't say that, right? And you're like, I should have answered with this very sharp comeback, right? Um, it often happened for me and often taking a shower. I'm like, no, she didn't. So I have three phrases that have helped me uh, with my aggressions. Um, so yesterday, because yesterday, of course, we face this daily. Um, I, I just say, what do you mean by that? Is my go to comment. And the first time you stop a microaggression is like the first leg day at the gym, right? You are in pain, you're, it's hard to do. But if you keep going to the gym, it will become easier. So the more you stop microaggressions, the easier we get. And there has been studies that shows that stopping the microaggression not only helps you, you know, deal with those feelings, it also helps everybody around you, empowers the people around you, he also encourages them to stop microaggressions in the future, and it helps with the challenges that microaggressions bring. So the microaggression that I encountered yesterday was what I was really from, from. And I say I'm from Venezuela. That's where I was born. Cannot change that, right? So you can say, what do you mean by that if the person is not happy with your response? So there's comments like, oh, you look very young to be a doctor, or are you sure you're a doctor? So you can say, what do you mean by that? Or another one when it is a macro aggression, I'm like, I do not feel comfortable with this comment. Or I don't know, if I don't feel comfortable with your comment. Don't apologize, because you shouldn't be apologized, apologize for being attacked. So you can say, I don't feel comfortable with this comment. And I have a workshop in microaggressions that is in YouTube. So I can send the link to Julie and she can share it. Um, it's, a, it's a workshop about how to deal with this and how to help yourself deal with the macroaggressions as you get home. Oh, that would be great. That would be a good resource. Um, and I think we have time for one final question. Um, this question is about the fact that there are some studies out there that show women physicians have better outcomes than male colleagues in um, like the hospital setting. and how do you think that those studies um, should be viewed, you know, in the lens of the bias that we already know is there for women? Because I think some of the studies in particular say that that women um, maybe are more compassionate in their care of, of patients and things like that. And in some ways that can be at odds with, you know, what we feel we need to do to advance ourselves within medicine. And, and you know, so it's, there's some sort of clashing of um, the characteristics in ourselves that we should try to amplify. Um, but how do you view that? That's kind of a complicated question. Yeah, so the, the data that they're referring is to the data that came out two years ago from Medicaid, Medicare reimbursement and CMS in which um, the 30 day rehospitalization and in hospital mortality was better for women compared to men. Um, and yes, women are most likely to be compassionate, but unfortunately, how that is measured is not accurate, right? So compassion and understanding comes with more time. So you spend, we spend more time with our patients, that also has been proven. But then you see less patients because you're spending more time with patients. So at the end of your year evaluation, your RBU evaluation, you are below your other colleagues because you saw less patients but, respond, but spend more time with them, right? So it is this fight that you cannot win. I wanna be the doctor I wanna be, but I also need to meet these metrics. So it has been shown that women are more likely to spend more time with patients in hospital settings, but also they have smaller teens, but I can see less amount of patients. So instead of having 18 patients in the census, they're most likely to have 14. So then they're seen as no efficient, right? So it's like you are a good doctor, but you're no efficient because you don't have 25 patients in your census. I think the studies that were shown are great, but we need to find better ways to measure this because patient care is very, um, it varies. It's like, are you a better doctor because you're not running late or are you a better doctor because you're staying and listening to your patient's concerns? But it is true. We get measured uh, by different standards and you still have to make the metrics. Um, I don't know if I answered the question, but I, I do want to know that we are trying to explore how to measure this 
and how to bring this value to institutions because everything comes to dollars. So how a patient that a doctor that sees less patients but provides more compassionate care is as good as somebody who sees 25 patients in a day. So when you come with the explanation of dollars is when some of the leaders listen. So we're working on that. So stay tuned for that. Great. We look forward to that. Well, again, we want to thank you so much, Dr. Duma. This lecture was um, so important and really eye-opening. Um, I think that many of us may watch it again, um, maybe with our, our children. Somebody did post that they got to watch this lecture with their 13-year-old daughter, which is amazing. Um, so again, thank you so much. And just a reminder, we have a focus group with uh, the Women in Winship um, Committee at 845. So we look forward to seeing many of you there. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone.